Okay. <laughs> Ladies, thank you for that. Sound men and women, thank you for that. And uh, we are really blessed to have people here who take seriously this ministry. I want to thank you for ministering to us this morning. Bow with me in one more word of prayer, because it's a weird morning, amen, but a good one. It's just, it's just there's, there's a strangeness about this. Father God, thank you. And Lord, we just, we, we're just going to continue rolling in worship to you this morning. We're not making any strange transition into some different part of a service so much as we are just continuing to praise you. Albeit this time we're going to just listen to your word and we're going to learn hopefully what you would have for us to learn this morning. And I pray for anyone who's going to be challenged here today. And Lord, mostly that our faith would be built up as we see the fact that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was tempted and yet never was there a chance of Him failing and falling. Lord, we thank You for that truth and we will celebrate it over and over as we go through this section of the life of our Lord. So Lord, again, may You be glorified and give the strength that is needed here today to deliver and to receive what it is that You would have us know today. I pray for John, second hour, because I know there's some controversial subjects that he has to talk about today. And Father, I pray for him, and I pray for protection on all of us as we gather in a place publicly to confront some of the things that are going on today. And some of us are living it out that we're already experiencing persecution in this world uh, for our stands for the truth. So Lord, thank you, and Lord, we count it an honor and a privilege to serve you even if that means suffering someday. Lord, I pray for all of us in the area of temptation, and I pray that today we would learn what it means to absolutely refute and shut down the solicitations to evil that the devil wants to bring to us. Thank you for the example of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Go with me to James chapter 1 this morning. James chapter 1, right off, we're going to lay a little foundation. We're going to repeat a little bit of a foundation because we need to. And going into this episode of the life of Jesus. Now, right after the baptism, there are some chronologists who uh, are putting in order or attempting to set in order the events of Christ's life. And some would say that he went and called his first five disciples and then departed to the wilderness. However, as our brother read this morning in our short passage in Mark's Gospel, which we will look at again in a moment, after the baptism account, it says immediately, that Jesus was driven or impelled to go into the wilderness. We're going to look at that. And I think there's an immediacy there in Mark's Gospel that just seems to put him right there. And all of the other accounts in the Gospels have the temptation immediately following the baptism. So I think that's a good place to start in terms of our understanding. But really we're laying a foundation with these three passages we're going to read before we get to Mark. In James chapter 1, verses 12-15, through 15, Listen closely to this instruction from God's Word. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, James writes, when he is tempted, that I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. I keep saying amen, but i got to keep saying amen. I love that. That's awesome. God's never going to waver or falter uh, in His purity and His holiness. He's never going to blow it and do something unjust. Or He's never going to wrongfully punish someone or, or allow anything to happen that has not perfection and holiness completely attached as its motive and its means. Everything God does is holy because God is holy. Amen? His nature is without sin. So He can't be tempted nor is he the tempter to anyone. If you're going through something in life and it's a temptation for the lust of the eyes or the, or the lust of the flesh or the pride of life, it's not God setting that before you to try to make you fall this morning. We'll see who it is. And we'll see how horrendously good he is at it. But right now, let no one say, verse 13, when he is tempted that I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But here's how it works. Each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. 
Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And then he says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And then continues to talk about the good gifts that God gives. But isn't that the truth about temptation this morning? You are drawn away, you are enticed, you are lured, and then there's the hook. And when it happens, you commit sin, and then sin brings forth death. i got wonderful news for you this morning. This was not a scenario that Jesus Christ had to be a part of. He had no lust with which to entice him with in that sense. He had no chance of, 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 of committing a sin and then bringing forth any kind of a death. But he understands the heat of the temptation. He understands what it's like to have those things presented to him and being in that place of deciding to follow the Father. Now, Jesus could not have sinned or fallen. That is going to be my continual refrain during this whole thing. And we're glad of that. We love that, don't we? We are so happy that Him in the wilderness is not this fingers crossed, oh, I hope He makes it. right? Oh, please, Jesus, come through for us or we're in trouble. There was never a chance. There was never a different option there other than Christ was going to defeat the devil. Amen? I'm happy about that this morning. But I read the James passage because that's what we deal with. And that is the anatomy of temptation for us as sinful beings. Satan has things to work with. The flesh is weak. The world is evil. And it has a lot of stuff within our own hearts to work with in order to entice us to try to give in to these solicitations, to these offerings of forbidden fruit all the way back to Eden. It's there. We have the capacity And how many of you gave into it this week? Don't raise your hand. I'll go ahead and raise mine. But don't you raise yours. This week I was driving along and I was like, man, I must be on crazy pills because I was listening to the radio and I was listening to this debate about Target and bathrooms and who's who's who and what's what and what they feel like that particular day. And I'm sitting here going, this is insane. My temptation was to just man lose it for a little bit while I'm driving, which has happened before, but I don't normally try to do that. And praise God, I was able to, 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 to restrain myself from saying and doing something really stupid, partially because at least this was the subject this week. So on one hand, when I get ready to speak on something, that's the week that I get nailed with this stuff. But on the other hand, sometimes it's like, but wait a minute, Jesus... Oh, but what did Jesus do? And then the Word of God begins to flood into your mind as a believer, and you go, thank you, God, that's truth. All this other stuff is crazy, but it's exactly what you said it would be like. And it helped me this week. I hope you have some stories uh, that are similar. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. I'll go through these very quickly. These are our foundations this morning about the nature of Jesus. For since He Himself was tempted in that which He has suffered... He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Jesus understands the devil's modus operandi. He understands his evil, fiery darts. He understands his methods. He understands his his entire mission to try to undermine and destroy all that God has done and all that God makes. And of course, he wants to upset the holiness and the purity of God's Son. And he can't do it, but he's going to try. And Jesus understands what it's like to have the heat aimed at him. Finally, Hebrews 4.15. All of this we have read, and we are just merely recapping this morning, which is something I'm fond of doing. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, this is Hebrews 4.15, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. You're going to hear those three words again over and over today. Why? Because we must drum that into our hearts and our minds about our Christology, our understanding of the nature of Jesus. There was never a chance for him to give in to these temptations. Are we ready to go then to the Gospels for this? Go to Mark chapter 1. that Brother Joe read for us this morning. It was short and sweet, but in that passage there's a whole lot now we may be there a little bit shorter this morning because i've lost my notes so that may be a really good thing but we're going to talk a little bit about what i can remember from what the notes said if that is what the lord wants us to really indeed look at 
But let us look at Mark chapter 1. And we are in verses, uh, yes, excuse me, verses 12 and 13. Mark 1, 12 begins with the word immediately. Eothis in the Greek, soon or at once. That's why I believe there's not another episode really that has been recorded chronologically between the baptism and his presentation. What does John do? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He goes, I am now convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. So we talked about the Lamb of God and the Son of God. Here's him being presented to all of those uh, by the Jordan that day. And John is the forerunner fulfilling his ministry perfectly. He is doing what he was sent to do to stay, stay, get himself out of the way and say, here's Christ at the forefront. And then it says here in, John, in Mark's gospel, immediately, what does it say? The Spirit, and this is the NASB, impelled him or drove him. Literally in the Greek, the Spirit him drives out okay, into the wilderness. Now the word here for driven out is ekbale from the word ekbalo, and this is the root that we get when we hear somebody in the Gospels, Jesus driving out a demon, exercising a demon. He's expelling the demon from the person. Jesus merely needs to speak and the demons flee from these people, right? The same picture here of being driven, though, into the east and the south, into the, into the wilderness of Judea. We don't know exactly the spot, although I was standing at Jericho, the ruins of Jericho, and we were able to look up at these mountains surrounding us there. And we saw the monastery on the hill, which is the monastery of the temptation. Now, I'm sure that monastery was not there when Jesus was in that area. But I'm telling you what, when you look at the Judean wilderness, and we saw this even at other places and other spots, it is barren, it is desolate. Yes, there are some trees. There are acacia or shatim wood trees there. There are little groves that happen. There, there are springs. There are other things. And of course, if you're in the rainy season, the dynamic changes a little bit. But listen, it is a stark, desolate place. Amazing. Here's Jesus coming out of the waters of baptism with this wonderful voice coming out of heaven. And of course, the dove coming down, the Holy Spirit alighting upon him. And now it is the Spirit, as Luke's Gospel tells us, that he was filled with the Holy Spirit as he was driven out into the wilderness. So what do I get from that? What do you get from that? God is in control of the pathway into the wild. Our sermon today, into the wild. Jesus is driven to a place that is not relaxing and fun. It is remote. It is a place to get away from other things, but that's largely because people don't want to go out there with you. It is an inhospitable wild place. At least, I believe, too, where Jesus was wherever he was driven out to. We don't know the exact location, but man, you can see how challenging it would have been. But it's the Spirit leading on. It's nothing else. It's not this thing of Jesus had an idea, man, i got to get out of here. I've just been introduced. I need, to, I need to bail. I need to run for the hills a little bit. No, the Spirit is driving him out there. What do we know about the wilderness in the Bible? It's a place of testing. Isn't that correct? And you, we could go through all the examples. I won't. Those are on the page of notes that I lost. So, the Spirit leads him out there for a specific purpose into this place of testing. But I also want to bring to your attention some other interesting aspect of this. For the Hebrews, the wilderness was also, and this is something you can see in Jewish writings of the Second Temple period, and even in the intertestamental period, of course, the wilderness was the haunt of demons. This is where the Shadim dwelt. This is why in Leviticus 16, when the scapegoat or the Azazel, the Ser Azazel, was placed, the priest puts his hands on the head of the goat and drives, you know, gives, casts lots. One of them goes to God. One of them is for Azazel, who is the fallen angel. You can read about this in uh, some other Jewish works that are not in the Hebrew canon. But nonetheless, he is a satanic fallen spirit. And the goat that goes to Azazel is the scapegoat which is taken and driven out into the wilderness. Several commentators have made something very fascinating here of Jesus being driven out into the wilderness as, again, a motif where he's fulfilling something about the ministry of the scapegoat. This is completed when he stands in Nazareth and he reads the scroll, and they try to do what? Throw him off the cliff. 
which was also what the scapegoat, the fate of the scapegoat that lands up with the unlucky lot, it's not luck, but you know what I mean, of Azazel or Azazel. Why do I say this? The wilderness is the place of haunting. The wilderness is the place of the evil spirits. What did Jesus say when a demon goes out of a man? What does he do? He wanders through dry places. This is his whole motif in this picture. So you understand Jesus is going out here and it is a spiritual warfare battleground. That's what I want to say. So if Jesus wins in this combat, which we know he does without equivocation, he wins. If he does, what is he saying to the powers? There's no mastery over me. All of the fallen angels, Satan himself, as he is confronting Christ, he's in the wilderness, he's in the place, he's on their turf, and he's telling them, forget it. You will not bring down the Son of God. And I, got, I think that has massive implications for our spiritual warfare today. I don't want to make too large of a light of it, but look at verse 13. Mark chapter 1, and he was in the wilderness, how long? Forty days being tempted by Satan. Let's stop there for a moment. Forty days is significant to God, is it not? We won't go to all the references, but they'll probably be online here. Uh, if you want to watch this again, they'll be tickering across the bottom of the screen. But in Genesis, we have 40 days and 40 nights of flood and rain. Am I right? We have Genesis 50, verse 3. We have the, an embalming that takes 40 days. We have Moses, Elijah, and the spies that went to the promised land fasted for 40 days. In the book of Acts, we're told that Jesus, after the resurrection, stayed here, what? 40 days before the ascension. What does that mean? It means that the number 40 there in many other places is very significant to God. Now, this is interesting because I looked this up. And Scientific American, of all places, helped me with this. But he's in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And you know what? We're going to skip that portion. That's on my other notes. I'll get back to it in the next passage. Let me read this one other part here. And he was, in verse 13, with the wild beasts, the therion in Greek, and the angels were ministering to him. The angel ministry happens at the end. We'll look at that when we get to the end. But he's out there in the wilderness, what? With the wild beasts. And I don't have a lot to say about this other than Jeremiah 50, Isaiah 13, Isaiah 34. Talk about the Siim, the wild beasts of the desert, the desert dwellers. We're talking about what? Jackals, wolves, even in those areas at one point, and I'm not sure about Jesus' day, whether they still had lions that roamed and bears and things of that nature. Listen, these were all the wild beasts. What's Mark's point of his gospel? It's an action gospel. He gets out into the wilderness where what? It is desolate. It is dangerous. And yet, is he alone? There's our question that we want to ask. Jesus going out into the remote wilds, but is he truly alone? And my contention is that he is not. Who's with him? The Father. The Father never left Jesus even in the wilderness, even in the worst place of temptation, even in the, even in the hardest, uh, austere circumstances that he has to go and be a part of, the Father never left Jesus. Amen? Who else is with him? The Spirit, the motivator, the mover of Christ into the wilderness. He's being led by the Spirit. This is all God's purpose. I love this. But who joins the party? Diabolos. The devil, he comes. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4 for most of the duration of our time left. This story is just, it's taken on a renewed power as I've been reading it this week. And maybe I'm a little older and I'm a little, uh, got a lot more temptations under my belt, failures and victories. I mean, are you here this morning? If you've walked with the Lord for a while, you're, you're just... Sometimes you hear these stories and you go, well, I've heard that a million times, but sometimes it just takes on a beautiful freshness when you're going through seasons of your life. This has helped me immensely this week with temptation. And I'm going to talk about in my thought life. I'm not robbing banks or anything, folks. But I, and I'm not tempted to rob banks. But here's what I, I, I struggle. My flesh is just so with me sometimes, and I'm so sick of the guy. Amen? Good grief. He's at the party, and the devil's there to try to stir things up. 
Jesus was led up by the Spirit, verse 1 of Matthew 4, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Tempted by the tempter. The word here for temptation is a scrutinizing. When Satan tempts somebody, he scrutinizes them. He looks them up and down for a weakness, and that's what he goes for. And we see this in the natural world, right? The lioness that's hunting there on the Serengeti, what does she do? She waits for the sick or the young or the lagger in the herd of the wildebeests, right? That's the one she gets. Why? Less effort, still good meat, right? The devil looks at Jesus, and he's starting to look him up and down. He comes out, and he goes, oh, there's something I can exploit here. And there are three temptations, aren't there? You don't need to turn there, but in 1 John, and I will have to get the reference to you. It will be on the screen because that's on the page of notes. It's not here. 1 John says temptation looks like this. It's the lust of the flesh, all right? The lust of the eyes and the what? Pride of life. The hubris that comes with being spoiled by the things of this world, which are passing away, John reminds us. Each one of these temptations has some element of that profile in it. But again, it's an attempt, and it's a false, foolish attempt because Jesus doesn't have lust of the eyes or lust of the flesh. Aren't you glad? He doesn't have pride of life. But he knows what it feels like to have that placed in front of him. Look at what it says here. Here's the weakness of Messiah in verse 2. As a man, he suffered this way. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Here's the understatement of the century. Ready? He then became hungry. I love that verse. Because that's like, that was like, you know, John baptized people because there was a lot of water there. I love that verse. Of course he did. Jesus, 40 days and 40 nights without eating. Yes, he's hungry. And I want to add, okay, I... Today, you guys are going to be proud of me. I am fasting between breakfast and lunch. <laughs> and I'm going to make it. I am going to make it, man. But have you ever fasted? Have you ever fasted? It should not be called fasting. It should be called slowing, in my opinion. Why? Because you become acutely aware of your addiction to food. Think about that for a minute. I did have a friend who fasted 40 days. And I appreciate that he didn't tell me or announce that because that's how Jesus says to do it. If I was on a fast, I'm not going to tell you folks about it. My wife would find it out, okay, because she lives in, you know, with me. But my, my whole point is, you know, fasting should be done as unto the Lord. Listen, Jesus, Jesus is fasting 40 days and 40 nights. So I looked up this Scientific American article, which I really appreciated. Gandhi fasted without food for 21 days, taking merely sips of water. Now, even when, when I think about 21 days, I get really hungry. Like, I'm like, are you kidding me? Okay, but he did that. There were certain people in Northern Ireland on a protest uh, in the 80s towards the British presence there, and they died. Ten, ten individuals passed away after 36, 38, 70-something days without food. The average that you and I are going to last if we're in a hospital bed and we do not eat, we refuse to eat, we stop eating, is 10 to 14 days. All right? But there's all kinds of fasts and hunger strikes that have been recorded that go past the 40-day mark. Here's the point. The body begins to eat itself, doesn't it, after a certain point. We've all heard that. I've heard your breath smells like fruit uh, because of some weird chemical thing that's going on as your body's devouring itself uh, in an effort to keep it sustained. Jesus, 40 days and 40 nights. And buddy, he was hungry. Obviously, he had water because a human body can't survive for that long. But I love that this is in here because this shows me, hey, my Lord was truly a human. 100% God, 100% man, but that 100% man felt that physical weakness. It felt pain on the cross. It felt the rigors of daily life. It felt probably getting cut up and bruised and, 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 and all of the other unpleasantries that our bodies go through as humans in a fallen world. Jesus experienced that. There was no sin element to it. But man, he was hungry. Would we agree with that? 40 days and 40 nights. Again, purposeful to God in a special way. But what dedication? What does it drive you to do? You are fully relying on God to go without food in the Judean wilderness. I promise you. That is not a place that you want to practice fasting. But Jesus did it. 
Why? Because he's being led in there to be tempted and he's being led by the Spirit and sustained by faith in the Father. There's the stage that we've set this morning. Now verse 3 of Matthew 4. The first temptation. We know the story, but let's look at some of the back details of it. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God. Very significant introduction, because again, this goes back to Eden. Remember, did God really say? And John the Baptist has just recently announced and proclaimed to all who would hear, this is the Son of God. So Satan's opening line to Jesus is what? If you're the Son of God. And I think that is laden with such, you know, trying to put a seed of doubt in there. But again, I'm not a subscriber to the idea that Jesus was this confused, harried mess of a guy who just found out he was God at the baptism and now he's freaking out. Right? That's the, the backstory that some people believe. He finds out he's God, and when the voice comes and the dove comes down, and that drives him into the wilderness, and he's running breathlessly through the, with the rocks and the bushes. Hi, oh, I'm God. This is amazing. What am I going to do? And that's when Satan, no, I think Jesus was weak from hunger, but I think he fully knew 100% who he was. Amen? I do not think there was an ounce of doubt in Jesus. I think Satan's the one who's got the disadvantage here. If you are the Son of God, and Jesus, of course he's the Son of God. Satan knows that. What's he trying to do, though? He's scrutinizing and he's going, I'm going to get him now while he's hungry. and I'm going to get him to do something. What's the crime of the first temptation that the devil wants him to do? He's soliciting him to do something. What does he do in verse 3? If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Luke's Gospel tells us this stone, which could very well mean that Satan picked up one of them and went, this one, make it bread. No problem for you, right? Is there any doubt with any of us that Jesus could have done that? Absolutely not. It could have been fields of dinner rolls. Amen? Mountain of matzah. He could have done it, man. He could have made it anything he wanted to because why? He's the Creator. He was there at creation. This was His creation that He's surrounded by. The dust and the stones and the rocks and the scrubby trees and the, the tumbleweed type things that are there and the thorns and the beasts. All that is around Jesus right now, He is in His creation. He is willfully submitting to the harshness and austere nature of that area and what He's doing by weakening, allowing His own flesh to be weakened for not eating for 40 days. Jesus is in control of this. If you're the Son of God, why don't you eat something? Why don't you make these bread? What's the crime? What would the sin be that Jesus would be guilty of if he said, okay, bread, let's eat? Obeying Satan. It's as simple as that. This would correspond to the sin of the lust of the flesh, wouldn't it? The cravings of the natural desires over and above what he's been sent out there to do to prevail in this spiritual and physical war with his own weaknesses as a human and and yet... There's no chance of Jesus saying, okay, let's do this, Satan. That's a good idea. First of all, I can't ever imagine Jesus going, you know, I never thought of that. That, What what am I doing? There's all kinds of bread seed out here that I could just make bread from and eat. That's not in the picture here at all, and I love it. Readjust maybe what you've heard growing up, that, man, we're sitting here wringing our hands, hoping that Jesus makes it through these three temptations. I've heard that taught. Oh, he's got, he's got to beat the devil as a man to win the legal right back to rule the world. You ever hear that one? That's a big scenario that's being taught. And yet there was never a chance that Jesus wouldn't prevail here. I love it. What does he say? Command these stones to become bread if you're the Son of God. But he answered and said, verse 4, It is written. And your Greek text is gegraftai, from the word grapho, to write or to stand as written. And he quotes the Old Testament, doesn't he? He says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I love this because of what Jesus will later reveal himself to be. Does anybody remember in the Gospel of John, Jesus will later tell them what? I am the bread of life. 
Jesus himself is the bread of life. Jesus said at another place that the Father takes care of his needs. That the will of the Father is his spiritual food. It is his sustenance. He is fully relying on the Father. He doesn't need to make stones bread. And so he says to him, listen, what's important? Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8 in your Old Testament. Jesus will quote three times from the Tanakh. Satan himself will try to quote Scripture at the next temptation. But Deuteronomy chapter 8 is the context. It is where Jesus is quoting from. And we're just going to read the first three verses. We could very well read Exodus 16, the whole chapter, which is the story of the Israelites being preserved from hunger by manna from heaven. God's going to provide for His people if they trust Him, amen? He's going to provide for Jesus. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3 says, All the commandments I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that He might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. There's the motif of the wilderness wandering, isn't it? Testing to see, trying to see of what nature the Israelites are going to be in terms of their faith. Are they going to keep God's commandments when it gets tough? Ask yourself today, are you fortifying yourself in your faith to when it gets rough around here and we get into our wilderness testing, are you going to live for Jesus? Are you going to obey His commandments no matter what? If you're not following Christ in a time of peace in the church, you're not going to do it when the war starts. But the war's already started. We're in it, and many believers don't even realize. You're already in the wilderness. You're already being tested every day. And there will be a time in this country, I believe, where our surroundings may become every bit as harsh as the Judean wilderness for Jesus. What do you think? Am I off on that? I can't help it. Driving down the road, listening to the radio this week, I'm going, oh, it's coming. It's going to be, it's, it's already happening. Get ready. But look what he says. He says, are you going to keep his commandments or not? Verse 3 of Deuteronomy 8. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, here's why, that he might make you understand that what? Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Amen? This ain't new. Jesus is quoting to the devil something that's already been revealed in Israel's past. See, there's a whole lot of other picture here of Jesus in the wilderness as being a type or, or a, a symbol of, of, of Israel as well. Jesus is the suffering servant. Uh, God's people are, are going to have to suffer, and then the desire is that when they go through the testing and the, and the temptations and the trials, that they would come out the other end gold. Amen? Jesus is pre, you know, being the figurehead of that in the wilderness, and he's winning. He says, write to the devil, and I want to I emphasize on these refutations. That's what it is. Here's the solicitation. Make these stones bread because you're hungry if you're the Son of God. Jesus goes, forget it, man, as it is written. It's not about bread. It's not about material, physical sustenance. It is about what? Trusting the Father. Trusting God. And with that refutation, quoting Deuteronomy 8, the bread of life, tells the tempter to take a hike when it comes to trying to get him to make stones into bread. Go back to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to actually finish the temptations here today. Lord willing. But, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Now Luke's gospel, by the way, saying the same content but reverses the second and third temptation. So the one that we're going to read now is the final one in Luke's account. Here's the point. There were three temptations, all of which drawing upon that anatomy of temptation, and Jesus prevails through all of them because he is without sin. Wonderful truths there. Verse 5 of Matthew chapter 4. Then the devil 
took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Now, some have suggested that this might have been a vision because Jesus is in the wilderness, is he not? And when the devil is going to show him the cities of the world, it says he does it in a moment of time, which would indicate a more of a visionary experience. He doesn't take Jesus to every city all over the world when he tempts him with that. Here he's suddenly, though, transported, if you will, to the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point on that wall. And what does he tell him to do? Second temptation, throw yourself down. Verse 6, he said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, there's that, that uh, seed of doubt, that attack on his deity, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, and Satan goes, well, I can quote Scripture too. Isn't that horrible? Isn't that just despicable to you? That the devil's going to try to misuse and distort God's word at all times. He quotes Psalm 91, 11 through 12. He says, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You notice how he's saying this? I would love to have heard the tone of the devil. How many of you would like? No, oh boy, let me ask that different. How many of you... Okay, let's talk about how would, you, how would you like to know what the sound of God's voice would have been like when he spoke? I would kind of like to know how the devil does it too. With his inflections, and in what way did he try to make this appealing to a hungry, weakened Messiah who was so obviously armed with God's word because he was the word of God? How are you going to make this appealing to him? I don't think it was for one second. But the devil's like, ooh, I'll take him to the pinnacle of the temple. I'll tell him, hey, why don't you commit suicide? Why don't you throw yourself off? Because after all, the angels are going to catch you. And maybe, speculating here, what better way to show the people that you're the Messiah that you jump off a wall and you miraculously survive the fall from that height? I share this carefully. Very carefully. In Israel, from day one, for this trip that we went on, I wanted to jump off stuff. Now before we pull the plug on me today and <laughs> take me to a, a nice person with a comfy couch, I had this situation going on as I was praying in there and we were on Mount Arbel the second day. We were on top of this beautiful summit looking over the Sea of Galilee. We went to Mount Carmel as well the same day looking over the Megiddo Valley. I mean, we were high up on a lot of places. And you know what I kept hearing? Like incessantly jump off of here like it was so weird i'm just telling i'm straight up telling you it's weird i've already talked this over with my wife so i can share this but i was telling her i was like when we were up there today and randy was teaching at the edge of this cliff i saw myself get up and in front of everybody just bail off the side of that cliff and i'm sitting there going this like i'm sitting there listening to him talk and i'm going am i going crazy right now like this is really weird why do i want to do that Now let me ask you this. Has anybody ever been high up on a building and you heard the little whisper? Come on. Please, somebody, anybody. I see some nods, yes. Where does that come from? I really do believe it is. And you know what? I want to be very careful and make it very clear. I am no kind of Christ figure. Understand that. Any more than any of the rest of us. So it's not like Satan's, you know, specially tempting me during my Israel trip, taking me to the pinnacle and saying, hey, throw yourself down. No, what I think he wants to do is I think he wants to undermine and destroy absolutely everything that God's trying to do through the life of his children. As imperfect as we are, as flawed as sinners, and ow, Martin Lloyd-Jones again, we're vile wretches. We're not good people, good grief. But God uses cracked pots. God uses clay pots hidden inside with heavenly glory. I mean, the glory is him. It's beautiful. But if he can take God's saints out, What does that do? It hurts and damages the testimony of Christ. I don't mean by natural disasters or allowing us to suffer and die for our faith. That's precious to God, believe it or not. But I'm talking about scandalous death and falling in sin. The devil wants to do that. It would have hurt the testimony of the power of Jesus had I given in to a temptation to go barreling off of Mount Arbel in front of the tour group as they were listening about this beautiful teaching from God's Word, what do you think they would have remembered from their Israel trip if some bonehead jumps off something? And yet the devil was sitting there going, you're going to do it. You need to do it. 
nobody cares anyway. I mean, this was not from God. This was the accuser. And, it, and when I say temptation, I cannot tell you that I wasn't sitting there going, okay, I agree with you on about eight of those points. Mm. Struggled. We were in places in Israel, and for whatever reason, for that entire 12 days, I'm sitting there going, I, okay, I'm not going to jump off this thing. <laughs> we were at the Pool of Siloam, which is a 20-foot drop down to the bottom of the Pool of Siloam, which is a great, mind-blowing picture. I've always pictured the guys waiting to get in the water, you know, kind of la lounging on the edge of the YMCA pool to roll into it. No, it's a 20-foot drop. You're committed. You want to get into the water while it's stirring to get healed? You drop off a 20-foot cliff. I'm sitting there going, maybe I ought to take a header into the 20-foot cliff of the thing while he's talking. I'm not saying this in what any way because it was not funny. I was not laughing at it. I was sitting in my hotel room at night going, why do I want why why am I being asked to kill myself? And then I was asked, why am I even partially enticed sometimes to do that? This is for somebody else here who struggles with believing that the world would be better off without you here. It's a lie of the devil, and he wants God's people to accept that. He wants God's people to, have, to be so victimized and so traumatized inside about what other people think of them and about what's going to happen to them and the fear that awaits on the horizon. He wants you to end it now before the difficult things come. Why? Because he knows if he can take us out at the knees, he destroys the work of the gospel in a small way. He's not going to win. He's not going to ultimately stop God from doing what he's going to do. Amen? Praise God. But you know what? He can defeat you if you let him. For me, because I'm a weird guy, I get weird temptations like that. That was my struggle. Now, I don't say that to in any way compare myself to Jesus here. Because here is the Messiah. Here is the Son of God being asked to jump off the pinnacle. Because why? After all, the angels aren't going to let you die. They're going to catch you before you hit the ground. You're going to supernaturally make it out of this. But again, what would be the sin? Obeying Satan. Right? I mean, fundamentally, right? I'm not going to do what you say, Satan. Jesus said to him, verse 7, On the other hand, it is written. You want to quote Scripture? I'll quote Scripture again. It is written. It stands as written. God has said it. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, not even a, an iota, I believe, of doubt in Jesus' mind. Oh, maybe I ought to throw myself down. Maybe I ought to make this bread. Never. Jesus hears it. Jesus goes, zip it, man. This is what God says. And here's a command for the devil. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. That's what it would be. Let's look at the final temptation. By the way, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. 6, you can look that up on your own in that quotation. But finally, in verses 8 through 11, the third temptation, worship me. And isn't this just like what we know the devil craves? Right? What's he say? Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Luke's gospel adds, in a moment of time. So once again, Jesus is given some sort of a visionary panorama of the glories and power and the authority represented by kings and kingdoms. And man, he's got it all spread out in front of him. Look there, Son of God. Look at this magnificent display of power. An earthly prestige. John in his letter might have called it the pride of life. The lust for power. Whatever you want. You know, Jesus, it's a... Now, and again, does it escape the devil that all of this is rightfully Jesus's anyway? Well, there's coming a time, and I've said this before carefully, when we call Jesus the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords now, we are referring to the person that will be finally designated as that. But right now, we are in a transition time where the kingdoms of this world have not become fully under the jurisdiction of Jesus Christ. You understand what I mean? For a temporary time, we have Satan as the God with a small g of this world. 
We have the entire world, 1 John tells us, lying in the sway of the wicked one. Satan, according to the book of Ephesians, I think it's 2 verse 2, is the prince of the powers of the air. 1 Peter tells us that Satan is roaming and ready to devour as a lion. He's free to do his dirty work in some manner of speaking. He's on a short leash, but he has authority, does he not? Luke's Gospel, you can read it on your own, brings this out a little bit more. Satan says, I have authority to give you the kingdoms of the world. This is where arises this teaching that Jesus has to defeat him as a man to get the legal right to rule, and I just don't know that I agree with that. I just don't know that I can follow that implication. I do know this. The solicitation is to worship me. In reading Isaiah and Ezekiel about the fall of Lucifer, don't we see that his ambition, his wicked pride, was to be like the Most High? The five I wills, to be exalted above the heavens and the holy mount of God and basically to have worship and then with the abundance of his traffic going from angelic being to angelic being, let's do this, we can do this, we can rise, we can rebel, and then him getting shut down. Now he's sitting out in the wilderness going, oh, but I've been given these kingdoms. It could all be yours. All you need to do is worship me. Folks, you know I believe that is Satan's one prime directive in his life. That is what he wants. That is what he lusts for most above all. And he is tickled pink when the church is into false doctrine, when people are bowing and praying to idols, when Christians are not keeping the commandments of the Lord and we put up idols in our hearts. Satan gets that glory. And he loves it. He craves it. He desires it. And in some warped, twisted way, he thinks in the end, that's going to accomplish him something. I got news for you. We can say just like Jesus said in this way, but Jesus said it, and it's far more authoritative than anything that's ever been uttered from the mouth of another human being as our closing verse, verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, or what? Get behind me. We've heard that, haven't we? Beat it, pal. In the south, he would have said, Get! That's what he says. It's a very strong command to get behind me or go or leave, depart, for it is written, praise God, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. There is no room for the worship of anything else other than the true God. There are no other commandments that you are commanded to obey other than the commandments found in Scripture from the true God. There is no other spirit that you are to be led by. There is no other anointing that is true. There is no other true abiding indwelling presence other than the Holy Spirit that we ought to be concerned about. There is no other salvation other than in the appropriation of the sacrifice of the spotless Son of God who at all three temptations that we looked at immediately, in my opinion, without any thought or reservation or any second thought about, hmm, that sounds like a good idea. Boy, those kingdoms of the world, bright lights, big city, that's for me. Jesus never wavered. It was an immediate response. Do this. No. We've got to do this. Do this. No, it's been written that we're to do this. Do this, no. Oh, but he was weak, maybe he was weak. No, Jesus was of sound mind. Jesus was of steely reserve. Jesus, the Son of God, was God and man, suffering, yes, in the wilderness, feeling the heat like a hot hair dryer in the face of what it's like to be solicited to evil, but never once doubting. We are not to sit here and sweat and wring our hands. Is he going to make it? And aren't we so relieved that the Son of God found it within Himself to stand to get... Listen, it was never a deal that could have actually happened. In closing, He understands your pain. He understands your position in that you are being attacked by the evil one at this very hour. And He's going to try to pull out every stop to get you to get enticed and to start bringing forth death through sinful acts and damaging your relationship with Jesus and others. And I want to exhort FBC right now as a specific 
body of believers here as our local congregation. We love Jesus. We are members of the same body. But I'm telling you right now, if you're getting into sin, if you're flirting with disaster, if you are being solicited this week, please for the good of the body of Christ, but most of all for Christ Himself, lean on the Word of God and put your faith in Him to get you through no matter what, no matter how appealing. Oh, but you don't understand. This one was custom made for me, man. I couldn't help it. The devil made me do it. No. Stand against the wiles of the devil. Have that helmet of salvation, that shield of faith, breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, feet shod with the gospel of peace. Put on that armor every day and let Christ be our example as the captain of our salvation. And when he was tempted, he did not give in. And I promise you, if we lean on his example in the power of the spirit that we've been given, we will overcome the evil one. We will be able to resist temptation. You're saying, well, not all the time, Pastor. No, you're right. But we will be able to get right back up, ask forgiveness, Jesus being our advocate, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we live to fight another day, and it is a fight, and he wants you to live, and he wants you to prevail. Amen? Are we ready for that? Okay, good. Last verse. Luke chapter 4, verse 13. We're leaving the wilderness here this week. When the devil had finished every temptation... He left him, oh, but it adds this, until an opportune time. Isn't that just like the devil? Oh, he's not done. He didn't go, curses, I'm, oh, well, well, I tried. He's going to still try to rub Jesus Christ out. He's going to still try to stop him from going to the cross. He's going to still try to stop him from preaching so that Israel... And of course, the Gentiles as well, whoever believes, will be saved. Satan is never done in his attack on the Son of God until his final defeat. And aren't we all getting ready for that to happen? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this episode in the life of Christ. And we thank you again for the powerful example it is to us, the testimony of the power of God in the Son of God. Father, we can say it is written and rehearse and recite and rejoice in your word whenever temptation comes to us because you have addressed everything and Jesus experienced what it is that we go through and yet prevailed in the power and the might of the living God. Father, help us not to, get into temp not to give in to temptation this week and let Christ be our example. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.